I'm Steve Morgan, founder of Cybersecurity Ventures and editor-in-chief at Cybercrime Magazine. I'm here today with Roger Grimes, data-driven defense evangelist for Know Before, the world's first and largest new school security awareness training and simulated phishing provider that helps you manage the ongoing problem of social engineering. To learn more about our sponsor, Know Before, visit knowbefore.com. Roger, welcome. Great to have you with us today. Always glad to be here. So, Roger, I like to think I can, you know, look into a crystal ball and, you know, come up with all of these great predictions and, you know, look ahead. But I have to be honest with you, you go back a decade ago, I was writing on cyber and I had no idea really that ransomware would create the havoc that it has, that it would be as big as it is. And I'm curious, I followed you, you know, you've been writing for so long, you know, 20 plus years. If you go back a decade ago and this really first came on the scene in a big way, did you imagine that it could become as big as it is today? There's no way I could have imagined how much impact ransomware would have taking down large organizations, organizations small and large, critical infrastructure, government, police, law enforcement, literally just, you know, taking out entire cities and municipalities. And probably the more surprising part is that we're not as a society globally doing more to stop it. I mean, it's literally interrupting critical infrastructure and commerce. And I'm still surprised that most people are taking it, thinking it's almost like regular malware. I, I'm surprised that society is still functioning without like literally making it, you know, one of the top problems that we need to solve together. So if you do a look up on articles on ransomware, you go back a decade ago, even if you go back seven, eight years ago, you would not see the words double and triple extortion. You know, some of the vocabulary that we have today to describe, you know, ransomware, just completely different. So maybe give our audience a quick primer, like the differences between the type of ransomware we were seeing back then and, and what it looks like today. Traditional ransomware up until about November of 2019 would be that this program got into your computer or network, ran around encrypting one or more computers, and then encrypted it and said, you know, if you don't pay us this ransom, we're not going to decrypt your data. But a lot of people started to get, because of ransomware being so successful, in about tw November of 2019, there started to be more potential victims that had really good backups. And they're like, nope, we're not going to pay you. We have a good backup. So what they started to do, ransomware, was one ransomware gang and then a second ransomware gang and so on. They started to say, hey, we actually have keys to the kingdom and we can do anything we want. And ransom is just one of the things we can do. So they started to look around and extract valuable data, intellectual property, emails, passwords, and they'd get employee passwords, business passwords, customers' passwords, if you had a customer site on there. And they started to say, hey, we can take all of these things and then say, if you don't pay us, we can leverage it to attack your customers, to attack your employees, to attack other people. We can release your intellectual property to the public. We can give it to other hackers that can use it to hack you. So there started to be, they called it double extortion, but I, I called it quintuple extortion because it was really stealing anything that they could get out of the company. And today, even though there's a, a slightly uh, decreasing percentage of people that pay the ransom. It's somewhere around 40% now. It used to be 60, 80%. Now it's around 40%. But the vast majority of those victims are paying the ransom, not because the data is encrypted, although it is many times, but because they want to stop the exfiltrated information from being shared publicly. So Roger, I want to pivot from the ransomware attacks and the strains to the gangs. I'm very curious your opinion on this. Personally, I do not buy into these ransomware gangs are shutting down. We read about it all the time. In my opinion, they're either rebranding or, you know, you have people moving from one gang to another gang that they're not stopping. What's your take? I read a stat today that came from CISA or some affiliated organization. It says 75% of the ransomware attacks are Russia related. 75%. And to be honest with you, that sounded a bit low to me. I would have thought it was even higher. I do think that it's a little bit of everything that we are seeing uh, more aggressive takedowns. We are seeing some people actually arrested if they're in places that are allies in the United States. Like in Ukraine, we had a bunch of uh, ransomware people arrested last year, but it is drops in the bucket. It is like arresting drug dealers or something. There's always another sergeant. They certainly, we do know for sure that they start their own ransomware gangs or they leave one gang, go to another gang. But we are arresting some. I think really the biggest impact I've seen is that we're actually following the money better and able to get back the money or make it harder for them to get the money. And that's had a, a you know, anytime you make it harder for the bad guys, that's going to cause increasing competition and, and increasing tension and fighting. And there will be some fallout just from that alone. 
So Roger, we read a lot about these ransomware as a kit tools, or you might call them, you know, ransomware as a service. How real are they? How many of them are there? And can a novice really use these tools to launch a ransomware attack? The ransomware as a service or as a toolkit, I think as far as I can read, there's hundreds of them out there and actively over a hundred, between 100 and 200 at any one time. You can, as a novice, if you have money, just a few hundred to a few thousand dollars, you can start to rent one of these. And if you don't mind paying more of your percentage of your take, they can actually uh, can actually provide most of the services. Like they'll compromise the websites they need to compromise, or they will provide you with the access to the systems. You know, you probably need to have a little understanding of what you're doing, mostly to avoid being captured and arrested. Uh, but they do provide, you know, a lot of these uh, higher end gangs provide a full range of services, including, again, helping you break into different sites and computers, providing you the credentials to break in. Uh, to different companies and organizations to exfiltrating, help with exfiltrating the data, uh, getting your ill-gotten gains in cryptocurrencies and how to exchange that out to real money. We know for sure that we've arrested people that were not huge digital crime masterminds. Uh, you know, they were more of this average person. Some of them uh, at times in court really didn't seem to have much expertise at all. But probably the average person that's using these is probably an above average computer user. So even though they have these kits and they have these services that can be used by people that aren't super smart about it, most of them still are fairly smart because you're taking a calculated risk as a criminal and you've got to hide how you get your money. So that takes a certain level of expertise that the average Joe or Jane on the street doesn't have or doesn't want to take. The average person doesn't want to take that risk. So Roger, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question that I really don't like to answer. Do you pay the ransom? Don't you pay the ransom? And let me preface by saying, I read so many stories, and you know, we follow these things. We follow up, we talk to uh, you know, a lot of victims. You see a press release, and the press release says, you know, there's been a ransomware attack. It's very standoffish. You know, they reveal a minimal amount of information, but it will say that they're working with law enforcement, they're working with the FBI, so on and so forth. And of course, the party line there is don't pay the ransom. And inevitably, not in all cases, certainly, but we read about a lot of those same organizations who you know, apparently were in touch with law enforcement and then d did pay the ransom. And I know every situation is different, but, you know, w what's our advice for small businesses out there? Uh, you know, do you pay? Don't you pay? You know, I think it's a business decision. If everybody didn't pay the ransom, it would result in the ransomware industry either going away completely or, or certainly being mitigated. Everybody didn't pay the ransom. They wouldn't make money. They'd go on doing other things. But I, I don't, there's always these proposals to make it illegal to pay any ransom. I think that is also wrong because you start to take an otherwise uh, legitimate organization and possibly make them criminal if they feel it's in their best interest. It's really a business decision whether they pay the ransom or not. I think the at the height of the ransomware ransom payment, it was between 60 to 80 percent of victims were paying. I read uh, from multiple sources that the percentage of victims that are paying the ransom is below 40 percent now, slightly below 40 percent and decreasing and has been decreasing over the last couple of years. Depending on the source, some of them say the, the ransoms that are paid are going up. It's interesting. I, I think it's a business decision for most people, but I think there is, again, why most companies are paying the ransom is not to get back the encrypted data, but as kind of a payment not to be attacked again by the same ransomware gang, if that's possible, and not to have their confidential information distributed publicly. So I don't think most people are paying the ransom hoping that the ransomware guy is going to help unlock their computers, although I'm, I'm sure that's a part of it for some of the victims. But most of the victims these days have fairly good backups or don't trust the ransomware gangs to help them recover their data. There's a lot of studies to show that when you pay the ransom, uh, you rarely recover all of your data. So there can be a decreasing value in paying the ransom. But I think a lot of it is kind of a protection payment, like you're paying the mob to make sure you don't get robbed again. You know, hey, pay us and we'll keep the other ransomware gangs out or something like that. So, Roger, before you go, uh, last question here. Looking ahead, 2025, 2030, as far ahead as you want to look, does this get any better? Is ransomware just going to keep growing and getting bigger? And, you know, are we just going to be fighting this thing for the next 10 years? Or, or do you think we turn the corner at one point? 
I don't know when we do. I, I think we have to turn the corner against ransomware and really all attackers and malware uh, because we won't be able to survive as a global community if we don't get in charge of the crime. If we continue to let crime to be as bad as it is, it's going to be hard to have the full benefits of where we're headed to as a digitized society. And let me say, every year I've ever been asked, if we're gonna, is it going to be better or worse the next year? I, I'm always safe in saying that it's going to be worse. I have seen signs, especially from CISA, that's the United States Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, that, and they've taken recommendations from something called the Ransomware Task Force and implemented them, and we're seeing success. We saw, at least in 2022, it looked like a significant decrease in ransomware. Question is, is whether or not 2023 kicked it back up. There's some sources saying that 2023 is still showing lower ransomware. There's a lot of sources saying that ransomware has kicked back up, and they think 2022 was just an anomaly. But I do actually, again, I'm, I'm always a cynic in thinking we're going to make things better, but it does appear CISA is doing some things better, like tracking the money, pulling back a identifying ransomware criminals and gangs and doing sanctions against groups that facilitate uh, ransomware and ransomware payments. Me personally, I have seen concrete steps that CISA and law enforcement and their allies have taken to make it harder for ransomware gangs to be profitable or as profitable as they are. Will that turn out to be, you know, the case that the next coming years will actually decrease the amount of ransom and ransomware attacks, or will it continue to increase? I don't know. But I think, I actually think 2023 is, uh, that will be a good test year to see, do we actually start to defeat, does 2023 become like 2022 and we're decreasing ransomware again, or does 2023, does it shoot back up? And there's some sense from what I hear, like the I hear the United States is having better success in putting down ransomware attacks, and now they're expanding globally and internationally, and they're and international places are getting more attacks than ever before. So we'll, we'll see how it works out. Roger Grimes, one of the top minds in our industry. Always great to have you on with us, and we'll talk again soon. Thanks. I'm Steve Morgan, founder of Cybersecurity Ventures and editor-in-chief at Cybercrime Magazine. Joining me today was Roger Grimes, data-driven defense evangelist for No Before, the world's first and largest new school security awareness training and simulated phishing provider that helps you manage the ongoing problem of social engineering. To learn more about our sponsor, No Before, visit nobefore.com. You can keep up with all of our media at cybercrimemagazine.com.